Today's episode is brought to you by the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience, or DAX for short. Look, this is the DAX co-pilot. He's Isn't so he cute? cute. I you love like his him? little hat. I do. He's, he's great. Uh, and this is AI-powered ambient technology that helps physicians be more efficient and reduce clinical documentation burden that's driving so much burnout. To learn more about how DAX Copilot can help restore the joy of practicing medicine, stick around after the episode or visit nuance.com slash discover DAX. Discover DAX. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Knock Knock Eye with me, Dr. Glockham Flecken, your one stop shop for all things eyeball, coming to you every week from my studio, usually after work. Uh, I've been talking about eyeballs all day, and I want to talk about them some more with you right now. Um, uh, thank, thank you for joining me. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, we are, are going to do like a, an on-call summary. So I, as a private practice ophthalmologist, I take call three to four times a year. Uh, it's for a week at a time. Don't feel sorry for me. Uh, I know it sounds rough, but you know, I get through it. Um, so I just had one of those weeks not too long ago, and so I figured I would just kind of go over some of the highlights, and we talk about the the the, the patients that I saw. Uh, you know, I'll I'll change the details of them a little bit to to protect identities and everything, obviously. But uh, some of the not so much the patients, but the diseases and what happened and and how I dealt with these types of issues on call. I think it'd be helpful. Um, and hopefully we all learn a thing or two. Uh, so before we get into that, though, and we, we talk about my call week uh, uh, match day just happened recently. Matt, this is, I, I spent, uh, as, uh, I was working, I was in clinic on match day, but uh, I tried to spend as much of the day as I could liking tweets on Twitter, liking the match day tweets. It's one of my favorite traditions. It's, it's such an interesting, it really, is, it's like a, a day on twi- now X, Twitter, whatever. I, I'm just, I'm just going to always call it Twitter. I just will. Um, it, it, it makes you feel like you're back when like, the medical Twitter community was still really active and like uh, very interesting. Now it's not so much, but uh, it's a day when all these med students who just match, they 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 post their their email that says they matched and how excited they are to do whatever specialty it is that they matched in, and all of these there's there's thousands of them, thousands of them, um, and a lot of them are they're people that they they don't really tweet that much or they don't have a big following, but every single match day tweet there's there's hundreds of likes like they get so much love from the community from the medical community uh from people outside of medicine uh a lot of times match day ends up trending on uh, uh on twitter it's just it's it's just a lot of fun and so i i've probably liked like 500 different tweets every time i saw that one of those match day tweets i would like it and uh it's just it, try to spread the love and get get the energy and excitement going because you can just feel it from these posts from these med students they're they're just so excited they've worked so hard to get to this point and and they're just they're all so happy to to see that email and uh and so what it what it i thought i would do here at the beginning before we get into the, the eyeball stuff is t- it made me think about seeing all this all the happiness it made me think about the the mo- the happiest days of my med school years like what were the days the moments the events where i felt the happiest in med school and so i wrote them down i'm going to share them with you so we're going to go from from 5 my fifth happiest day that i can remember uh down to number 1 all right so we'll start with number 5 i w- i put my white coat ceremony at number five, I still remember a lot about it. It was I had uh, we, we had our white coat ceremony. Dartmouth did it a little bit differently. We have it 
uh, like about a month into to 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 med school. So we already had you know made like little friend groups and and we were really getting to know each other uh, as classmates and we're getting into the um, uh, all, all the the coursework and everything. So we're kind of getting in the swing of things. Then we had our our, our white coat ceremony where we receive our short white coat as opposed to the long white coat that fully formed doctors get to wear. Uh, we as med students get to wear a half-sized coat. And me, on I'm tall, I'm super lanky, and so it looked like a quarter-sized coat on me. Uh, and so my, my excitement for that day, the reason it's number five on my list, is because my excitement was quickly tempered by the fact that I looked like a, 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 a giant like person wearing a child sized coat. It, it, I looked ridiculous and I realized, Oh, I have to wear this thing every time I go into the hospital for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, uh, but it was very exciting because all the family is there, just a lot of excitement. We're starting this, this huge journey and we're, we're all very excited and, and just looking forward to, to, to just getting into it. Uh, we had, we had not been beaten down by the medical system at that point. So it was just a very exciting, very fun time. That's number five. Number four, uh, I put down um, walking out of my general surgery rotation. <laughs> that was a happy day. That was fantastic. Uh, I spent eight consecutive weeks on vascular surgery, which is a rough rotation. Uh, it was toward the beginning of my third year, so one of my first clinical rotations. And I still remember how it felt. That last day, finishing, knowing I did a really good job. I tried. I worked hard. I worked very hard because I really wanted honors. I really wanted to. That was the one rotation like I wanted to get a good recommendation from uh, because I was going into a surgical field, ophthalmology. And uh, and so I I, um, I I tried really hard. I worked hard, and and uh, but I, I hated most of it. <laughs> and so I was ecstatic that final day when I said, when I, the last thing I said on the last day, is there anything else I can do for you to the fellow? And they're like, no, you should go home. Thanks for all your hard work. And I left and I just had this, the biggest giant smile on my face as I left that rotation and got to do something else finally. So that's number four. Number three, um, the, the time I diagnosed a pheochromocytoma. These types of things, these opportunities don't come along very often. Now, those of you who don't know what a pheochromocytoma is, it's an extremely rare tumor. I don't even remember. I think it's on the adrenal gland. It's 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 just it's one of those. It's like a joke diagnosis among med students. It's like oh, you you diagnosed a pheo. Like no one because no, no one does it. It's 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 these it's one of these things that you learn about. Everyone knows about a pheochromocytoma, but you never see it. And I'm not going to say I, 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 I suggested that this might be the diagnosis on my internal medicine rotation. I suggested this could be the diagnosis on a patient and imaging was done. The lab test, the catecholamines were ordered um, and because it was a reasonable thought and turns out the patient had a pheochromocytoma. It's it left such an impression on me that I'm talking about it right now. Like that's of all the things I've diagnosed in my life, like that is probably top of the list. All right. And and again, it's just like, you know, as a med student, you're you're just you're trying to to contribute in whatever way you can. And uh and so when I threw that out there, like part of me was like, oh, I'm gonna sound smart by saying this. But then I ended up being right. Oh man. I'm just I right I'm just and I'm still thinking about it. I'm just reveling in in my in my intellectual prowess in that moment. I I didn't get a lot right during that rotation uh whenever I got asked questions, but I got that one. So I was I was very proud. I was very proud of myself in that moment. That was number 3, the third happiest day of my life in, in as a med student. Uh number 2, match day. My match day, not everyone else's match day. So Ophthalmology has a different match. Uh, there's only a couple of rotations, just the 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 ball centric specialties. So ophthalmology and urology, uh, we do a separate match 
uh, which is in January, I believe it was. It's much more anticlimactic than the um, uh, than the, the, the match that just happened in March, where all the other specialties figure out that whether they matched or not. Uh, it, it, it's it's a little bit more low key, but uh, I I remember you know getting the email, seeing it. Uh, I'm the kind of person like I I didn't want anybody around me. I've seen TikTok videos. Uh, where everybody has their family there and they're checking the email uh, on camera uh, and then getting very excited. I, that, I, I, that, no, I, my thought was like, I needed to be alone whenever I, I find out either. Yes, I matched all as well. Ec- ecstatic, you know, just very happiness all around. Or of uh, absolute shame. That that's that was my thought process at the time. Is that I just I need to be by myself. I don't want to subject whatever energy was in that room to other people. I needed to just. But that's just the introvert of me, though. So anyway, but it, I ended up matching in ophthalmology, and so I was very happy. So that's number two. But that's why it's number two because there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety involved around match day. So it's not total happiness all day. It's a lot of happiness when you find out you match, but uh, leading up to it, it's just uh, like your stomach's in knots. You want to throw up. That's number two. Number one, graduation day. By far. I have, I, I still, I remember, I, I, I have all the pictures with my classmates and my family, and, and th- there's, there's no better energy than a commencement ceremony. Like, it is... It's, I don't really remember like college. That wasn't as big of a deal to me. Med school was a big deal. And, and since med, I've been very fortunate to be able to deliver some uh, commencement addresses since uh, I graduated med school. And I love doing that. I try to do one or two every year if I have the opportunity. And uh, the, the, just the excitement, the energy, there's nothing like it. There's, it, it's just pure happiness. No, there's, there's, there's no bad vibes anywhere during a commencement for med school. And so that was uh, number one by far. That was, so there you go. My top five happiest, happiest days in med school. Okay, let's take a quick break and then we will get into some eyeball stuff. Hey everybody, old news, but good news. We're coming back to the Irvine Improv on Sunday, March 24th for our show, Wife and Death. That's right. We're going to talk about the time you died. And came back to life. It'll be a tragic comic, multimedia, memoir, stage show extravaganza. And some of my characters might show up too. You'll just have to come and check it out and see for yourself. To buy tickets, click the link in the description below, or you can visit glockenflecken.com slash live. We'll see you there. All right, so we are doing an on, on-call summary. I don't have a fa- like a fun name for for doing this, but uh, about probably I'm guessing th- yeah three to four times a year I'll do this where I just kind of go through my call week uh, that I had. I'm not going to tell you when. It's very important when talking about things that really happen with patients. Uh, I, t- I tell this to other people all the time. Obviously, everything's got to be HIPAA compliant, so. When necessary, I have changed details of these things I'm about to tell you. But also, it's really important to keep it time immemorial. Like, I'm not going to tell you I had my call week last week. Like, I just got off the call week. Because it's better that you don't know when it happened. Because honestly, it doesn't even matter. You know, was it two months ago? Was it three months ago? I'm not going to tell you. And you don't need to know. Just know that it was in the recent history of my life that I had a week of call and I haven't really talked about it until now. So um, I had some interesting things uh, to uh, go on. It was actually a more interesting call week than I've had in quite a while. Uh, And interesting is not always good when you're talking about on call. So just, uh, I think I've talked about this with you guys before, but um, I cover four different community hospitals Uh, Nothing higher than a level two trauma center. So really bad traumas, mostly open globes, those types of things. They will typically go to the main hospital. Um, uh, Occasionally some trauma comes in. So and I'll get to one of those as well. So, so uh, four community hospitals plus all of my practices, patients. So it ends up being 
mostly phone calls from patients. Y'all you know, get a lot of those. Like they have questions about their drops that we sent them on, or they they had surgery recently and they're having some problem, and or or they're you know um, they're established patients and they have an eye problem. And instead of going to the emergency department, they give us a call, which I always encourage people to do. If you have an established relationship with an eye doctor, and you have something that you don't feel is an emergency, but it's bothering you, like it. Just, just call, just call your office. They, they, they're going to have someone on call for you. They will, they should, if they don't, yeah, that's, that's not great. I think all, all physician practices should have some kind of on call option for their patients, but that's just me. So anyway, I was on call and, um, um, the first patient I'm going to tell you about is a patient that, uh, was in a car accident and, um, I got called because the patient was no light perception vision. So remember, remember how we check vision, right? You start with the, the, the chart. If they can't see the chart. Then you go to hand motion. You wave your hand in front of the patient's face. If they can't see that. Or sorry, you go to count fingers first. If they can't see count fingers. You go to hand motion. They can't do hand motion. Then you hold a light in front of their eye. Well, this patient could not see that light. So they were no light perception vision. And a CT scan, because the patient had a trauma, so they got a, a CT scan, uh, showed that there was proptosis, there was bulging of the eye, and what looked like a retrobulbar hemorrhage. So retrobulbar, that's the patient that came in. I got the call. And um, this, is, this is an interesting one. And I don't think I've talked about this with regard to all the pants patients. When I started doing these knock-knock eye episodes, we went over a lot of the pants patients. We didn't do a specific pants patient episode on retrobulbar hemorrhage. Now, those of you who are, <laughs> have only been listening to this, these episodes, maybe this is the first one you've heard, you're probably like, what on earth is a pants patient? So I should probably, because I haven't talked about this in a while. Uh, this is a patient where um, when I get the call as the on-call ophthalmologist, it, it, it makes me uh, put my pants on to come in to see the patient, which is not that frequent for an ophthalmologist. All right. So it's notable. It's notable when a pants patient comes in for me. So a retrobulbar hemorrhage, um, let me just talk about physiologically what's happening and why this is such an emergency. All right, so a retrobulbar hemorrhage is exactly, exactly what it sounds like. So retro behind bulbar eye. Okay, so behind your eye is the orbit. The orbit is surrounded by bones. It's made up of bones. All right, so it's like a little cave, the orbit is. And your eye sits in that cave. And behind the eye, within that cave, you're, you're, you can think of your eyes like that's like the front of the cave, all right? And so there's all this space behind the eye, which is in the orbit, and that space is enclosed by bony walls on three sides, up or four sides, up, down, left, and right. There's this bony orbit. And a lot of blood vessels, there's some fat in there, there's nerves, there's a ton of stuff behind the eye, all the cords all the things that plug your eye into your brain and your your cardiovascular system, all of that stuff is in the orbit. So it's a very important structure. If you have a major trauma, what can happen is you can break some of those blood vessels that are in the orbit. They can start to bleed. And if you tear an artery, if you have an arterial bleed, which is high pressure bleeding, then that orbit, that space can fill up with blood. And you can imagine if you're filling up an enclosed space, it's going to increase the pressure. And so what's going to happen as that blood starts to fill up the orbit, it's going to start pushing the eye forward, what we call proptosis. The problem is it can only push the eye so far forward before the eye can't go forward anymore. Because remember, the eye has an optic nerve that connects it to the brain. Fortunately, there is some redundancy to the optic nerve. The optic nerve can stretch, all right? Just like a ping pong ball with a with a with a with a uh, with a string attached, all right? You can it can push it forward, but eventually that string, that optic nerve is going to be taut and the eye can't be pushed any more forward from the orbit. 
All right. And so what will happen is that you have the pressure pushing on the eye and it'll, it kind of, what happens is the eye gets, gets trapped by the eyelids. And so it's kind of that you can think of the eyes just kind of getting smashed from all different directions. It's, it's being pushed against the eyelids, which aren't allowing the eye to go forward anymore. That optic nerve is taut. The eye has nowhere to go. So it's going to get compressed. It's going to get compressed. And that increases the pressure inside the eye. And that's what's called orbital compartment syndrome. So a retrobulbar hemorrhage, bleeding behind the eye, causes an orbital compartment syndrome where pressure goes sky high. And so normal eye pressure, it's about 11 to 20. Retrobulbar hemorrhage causing an orbital compartment syndrome, that can increase the pressure to 60, 70, 80. It only takes, it takes minutes for you to permanently lose your vision when you have a high pressure like that. It can, you can start to really lose vision very quickly because high pressure, if the pressure is so high, blood can't get into the eye. So it's, it's just, it's just, you just lose all blood flow to the eye and that's what causes things to the eye to kind of die off. So this is a pants patient, but in a different way, this is a pants patient, mostly for the emergency physician. That's, I mean, uh, like almost all of their patients are pants patients, right? I mean, they're, ob they're hopefully they're already wearing pants because they're already there. But this, this, this is a, I don't know what the equivalent of a pants patient is for emergency to, uh, physician. You guys help me out with that. But um, it's, this is a, this is basically, it's not, it's, this is the type of patient where you treat it, the emergency physician, and it really needs to be treated right then and there. You can't wait for an ophthalmologist to get out of bed drive to the hospital and do what needs to be done for this patient. It's got to be treated faster than that. So this is like even more emergent than a pants patient. All right. There's no time. It's got to be treated before I can even get there. And the way you treat this, remember, because the eye is being pushed forward, but it gets trapped by the eyelids. So what do you got to do? You got to remove the eyelid. And that's how you treat orbital compartment syndrome. So it's the lower eyelid. You basically, you just take the outside part of the eyelid and just, it takes two seconds. You make a couple incisions and just release the eyelid from the, the orbital bone right there. So you can feel the bone right on the, ed, the out, outside edge of your eyelid. Your eyelid's attached to that bone. And so you just, just make a little incision and that allows that allows the eye to push forward a little more. That helps release the pressure on the eye. And you can save someone's vision. So, my <laughs> one of the, I think it was the first, I think it was a Friday night, I believe. Uh, bad trauma. Patient had an orbital compartment syndrome on CT. And I was actually getting the call because we have wonderful, very good emergency physicians in our community. They were calling me because they there was an orbital compartment syndrome patient. Uh, they had already treated it, so they did the la what's called a lateral canthotomy, cantholysis. They were they they just cut away that lower eyelid, and the eye pressure was down to like the 25, 30 range, which is much much safer. That's saving someone's vision. So shout out to that emergency physician. Shout out to all physician emergency physicians who do that because they don't do that very often. And I, I know for a fact it's very it's a challenging thing for them to do because they don't get that opportunity to do that very often, and uh, it's it's scary as well. Um, there have been a couple times when I just happened to be in the emergency department. This was in in training. Uh, I just happened to be there when a patient needed one, and everyone gathered around. It was like I was doing this this lateral canthotomy as the ophthalmology resident, and like every emergency physician in the department was like watching because it's that rare. So anyway, that was exciting. I didn't actually do the treatment, but I heard about it afterwards and got that patient in to see me in clinic the next day. Uh, actually, no, sorry, that one, I, I went in to see that patient. Sorry, that because it's still a pants patient for me. So I went in, saw the patient and, uh, you know, made, uh, looked for the other injuries and everything. So anyway, th that was very exciting. That was, that was like, that's enough for one night, really. That's enough for a whole week, to be honest. 
Um, the rest of the week went pretty routinely. I had a viral conjunctivitis case I got called about in the emergency department. That patient followed up with me the next day. Um, and that's not you know as interesting to talk about. Uh, but one thing was very interesting. Uh, I had an eyelash extension case. I've been needing to talk about this for a while because I'm, I'm seeing this more and more um, because the eyelash extensions are very popular these days. I think we all know that. We all see a lot of pe people that have eyelash extensions. Uh, well, a lot of, sometimes they end up in my chair, in my clinic or in the emergency department because they're having some kind of problem, reaction, Typically, it's to the glue, the glue from eyelash extension. So let's talk about glue eyelid injuries, glue, super glue, eyelash glue. Uh, this happens more frequently than you'd think. I bet a lot of emergency physicians who are listening probably have seen this or some form of this. So um, the patient that I got called about while I was on call was um, a patient who had just, I think earlier that day, had had eyelash extensions done and the eyelids were, were like swollen shut. So um, those of you who may not be familiar with eyelash extensions, basically they're the synthetic fibers that are applied to your natural lashes for this is a cosmetic thing, right? So, uh, and usually I think there's different ways to attach them, but the most common way to attach these eyelash extensions is using glue. Now, glue in the eye doesn't mix very well. Now, there are certain glues that we will use during surgery. We use glue on the eye, in fact. But this is special cyanoacrylate type, like a special glue that's safe for the surface of the eye. The glue that's used in eyelash extensions is, is not that. And so it's very important to keep this glue out of the eye because it contains chemicals like formaldehyde, even lead, benzoic acid. These are not great for your mucous membranes, in particular, the eye. Okay, so... Uh, a pa that patient had come in and um, was clearly having a reaction to whatever glue was applied. So um, let's just go over some of the things that can happen from this glue. So basically, you can get it, it's it's like an allergy. Uh, so, you know, it's that that's one thing that can happen. You can get an uh, like what we call an allergic blepharitis. Blepharitis is inflammation of the eyelid that you get redness, itchiness, irritation, swollen eyelids. And that can happen uh, hours. It can even happen days after you get the eyelash extensions applied. Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, like I said, those harmful chemicals, formaldehyde. I, I actually had to look it up. What's, what's in eyelash glue? Freaking formaldehyde. That's like how you preserve frogs in in your like high school science class. I mean, come on, formaldehyde on the eye. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, so anyway, all these allergies, these are all allergens that can cause your immune system to go crazy and get real big, swollen, irritated, itchy eyelids. Um, you can also get that glue can get on the surface of the eye and cause, um, uh, cause erosions of the cornea. Uh, it can also cause you to, to permanently lose your eyelashes. If the inflammation gets so deep into the eyelid that it affects the hair follicles, you may end up actually losing some of your eyelashes. All right. And that's the opposite of what you want. So the point is, with eyelash, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and tell you you shouldn't get eyelash extensions because there there are worse cosmetic procedures for the eye out there, and the vast majority of places do it well and safely to prevent any of that glue from getting onto the surface of the eye or really even touching the skin. Like that's that that's, that's really what you want. You don't you want to put those eyelash extensions not right on the skin of the eyelid a little bit up above the skin so it's you're you're just applying the glue to the eyelash itself and not to the to your actual skin um 
And so most places do fine with that. But this is not like a super well-regulated thing, right? Like, I don't know. I, I, I've never had them done. So how do people choose what places to get eyelash extensions? I don't know. Uh, how do you control for what kind of products they're using? What kind of glue they're using? I, I don't think there's a way to do that. I, I don't know. So you just got to be really careful. And there's some some preventive things that you can do that, that can help with this. Um, uh, you want to avoid, the biggest thing is avoid washing your face. All right, the first few hours after these extensions are applied. That's one thing. If you're going to get eyelash extensions, Personally, I would say don't bother doing it. But if you're going to do it, um, you want to avoid getting your face wet for the first few hours because it sometimes it takes like four hours, six hours for the, this glue to, to, to solidify completely. And so if you, if you wash your face or you get water on your face, you go swimming or something, then that glue is still liquid and it can, it can kind of, you know, get into the eye and cause lots of problems. All right. So, um, that's the biggest thing. All right. And, and maybe like read the Google reviews. I don't know. Talk to friends, like go to places that, that you feel like you can trust. <laughs> I wish I had a better way of helping you determine how to trust like an eyelash extension place, but, um, I, so I can't help you there. Just do your due diligence. I'll, I should say. And if you're ever on the fence, maybe don't do it. I don't know. Cause I, I mean, I'm biased because as an ophthalmologist, I see it when it goes wrong and none of this is like permanently scarring. That's why I'm not like railing against it. Like I do eyeball tattoos, you know, nothing here is going to eyelash extensions. Even if you have a reaction to them, like you're going to be fine. Like I've never seen someone go blind or even close to it from a reaction to eyelash extensions, but it can land you in the emergency department because you're you're, you're in pain and you're not sure what's going on, but it's probably that you're probably reacting to the glue. So the other, um, uh, <laughs> this also reminds me of the other kind of glue injuries that I have seen from time to time, which is a super glue to the eye, super glue. Um, you know, it, it, it'll happen every so often where someone will come in and they'll, you know, the most likely reason is because they get their eye drops mixed up with super glue, which brings me to my eyeball tip of the week. Don't keep your eye drops and your super glue in the same place in your house. If you have like a drunk, ju a drunk, a junk drawer, which we all have a junk drawer, right? I got a drunk drawer, drunk, junk. I got a drunk drawer too, but a junk drawer, uh, uh, it, it's not a place where you want to keep stuff that you are supposed to apply to your eyeball and stuff you're not supposed to apply to your eyeball. So keep the, the, the eye drop shaped bottles away from each other. Unfortunately, a lot of super glue bottles look kind of like eye drop bottles. And so you get people that don't see very well and they can grab the wrong thing. They put a drop of super glue in their eye. This always really scares people, but you might be surprised to know that even Gorilla Glue, like super, like the super glue, that stuff will not make you go blind. Worst case scenario, you get a corneal abrasion. But you're always scared about it because, well, what, what's the first thing you're going to do? You feel something go in your eye. You're like, oh, that's not an eye drop. That's something else. You close it, right? That's what you're going to do. That's your reflex. You close your eye. Oh, what is that? And you try to wipe it away but it's freaking super glue. And so it acts very quickly. And so all of a sudden, oh crap, I can't open my eye and people freak out. So they go to the emergency. To, understandably, right? Like if you don't know anything about this, you're going to be scared about this. So they freak out, they go in and uh, most, I'd say most emergency physicians are pretty good about that. You know, they'll try to to open the eye, you know, manually, just use their fingers to try to get the eye open. Uh, if you can't get it open, and I've gotten calls about this, um, the reason the eye is is closed and unable to open is because it's just because the eyelashes are glued down, the upper eyelashes are glued down to the lower eyelid, or the eyelashes are glued together. So it's not that the eyelid is glued like onto the eye and you can't open it. It's just because the lashes are glued down. And so the easiest way to get the eye open is just to cut the eyelashes. Now, people aren't going to like that. Oh, you're going to 
sacrifice my eyelashes. They'll grow back, I promise. Eyelashes grow back. But if often if you just trim the eyelashes, you can get the eye open real easy. Yeah, and then you just rinse the eye out. And again, that glue, you know, it actually super glue is much closer to the type of glue that we use in eye surgery uh, compared to like eyelash extension glue. That being said, don't, that doesn't mean you can use, put super glue in your eye. Don't do that. Like there's never a reason to do that. Um, but my point is it's not a type of glue that you're, you're not going to go blind from it. All right. So really no type of glue you're going to go blind from. Um, but I probably just shouldn't even say that because I don't want to give anybody a reason to feel complacent about glue in their eye. It's, it's a, it's not a good thing. All right. So just, just again, don't do that eyeball tip of the week. Keep the glue in the garage somewhere else where you, you're not going to be, you know, in, in nowhere close to your eye drop bottle. Um, all right. That's about all I can tell you about glue in the eye. <laughs> so that was my call week. Not too bad. I went in twice over the course of a week. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be people who have much busier call weeks who are like, I can't believe he's complaining about this. I'm not complaining, you guys. I'm not complaining. I recognize I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate. Also, that I work with extremely capable emergency physicians that are, are able to take care of a lot of things that we work well together. I can help them out over the phone. Doing, I can't usually get the slit lamp working, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, and, and they do great. They can take care of a lot of things. And, but you know, I come in when I need to, I came in a couple of times. It's mostly the phone calls, lots of phone calls I'm answering over the course of the week. So, but again, three weeks a year, I can't really complain. So that's my call week. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm your host, Will Flannery, also known as Dr. Glockenflecken. Thanks to executive producers Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brooke, editor and engineers, Jason Portiz. Our music is by Omer Benzvi. Again, you guys, let me know if you have suggestions for uh, for for episode ideas. You want to hear? This was this was kind of all over the place, so I didn't have one unifying theme. It was just I just I just turned on the camera, started talking. So sometimes that's the way it's got to be. Uh, and congratulations to all the people that matched, all the med students that matched. Uh, it, uh, I'm so excited for all of you. And those who didn't match, you will, you'll get there. You get there. There's all, so many examples of people that didn't match that came back the next year or the year after that, and they made it work. Uh, it, it's going to take you a little bit longer. Maybe you have to do some extra things, some research, some fellowships, whatever. Um, uh, but but you'll get there if you want it. You will get there. We need doctors, so don't give up. All right, you're not a failure. This is uh, uh, you're not the only one that has failed to match. Um, some of it's not even up to you, right? A lot of it's not up to you. It's a match. It's an algorithm. And we're at the mercy of the algorithm sometimes. Um, and, um, and so uh, just keep your head up and keep going. All right. I uh, wish all of you the best. And uh, we'll see you next time. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.